1966, Boeing faced a choice that could make or break the company, betting everything on a colossal aircraft that no one believed would ever get off the ground, not even the engineers. They wanted to create a jet that could carry twice as many passengers as any other aircraft in the sky. But in the 1960s, this was practically impossible. In the 1960s, Pan Am was the king of international air travel. The CEO, Juan Trippi, was obsessed with the future and convinced Boeing to chase it. He demanded a jet unlike anything the world had seen, one that could carry twice as many passengers as the Boeing 707. Airlines needed cheaper long-haul flights, and Tripp believed that size, not speed, was the answer. But the timing couldn't have been worse. All eyes were on the Concorde. Supersonic flight was the future, they said. The US, the Soviets, and the British-French alliance were pouring money into fast, sleek aircraft that promised to cut transatlantic flights in half. But here's the question. Why build a lumbering giant when sleek, needle-nosed jets like Concorde were on the horizon? They agreed to build the 747, but with zipped lips and praying hearts. Failure was glaring like a nail in a pack of needles, but it was a risk they were willing to take. But with failure lingering in the minds of every engineer, they decided to add a little fail-safe plan. If the future really did belong to supersonic jets, Boeing's jumbo would need a second life, which they determined to be a cargo plane. This made the work more taxing because this time, they weren't just building a plane, they were building the first convertible commercial to cargo plane. The Continental Divide is a ridge of high... That meant a wide fuselage, flat deck, and, most critically, a raised cockpit, so the nose could open upward for freight. The move was genius. Boeing could satisfy Pan Am's dreams and protect itself if the SST craze took over. For those who don't know it, SST stands for Supersonic Transport. It's a passenger jet that flies faster than sound. The most famous was, as I've been mentioning, the Concorde. But ironically, supersonic travel never took off the way people expected. Concorde became a niche product. The SST programs collapsed, and Boeing's backup plan became the most iconic silhouette in aviation history. At takeoff, it would weigh over 700,000 pounds. No engine on Earth could lift something like that. Not even a crane could lift it. Boeing had the airframe, the vision, and the orders. What they didn't have was power. That's when the cavalry came. The Pratt & Whitney JT-9D, a new breed of engine called a high-bypass turbofan, Bigger, quieter, and more fuel-efficient than its predecessors. On paper, it was exactly what the 747 needed, but in reality, it was a ticking time bomb. During early tests, the JT-9D failed, woefully and repeatedly. Compressors stalled, fan blades cracked, vibration shook engine mounts loose. One engine literally tore itself apart on a test stand. Boeing engineers were watching their entire project hang on a prototype that couldn't stay in one piece. Their hopes fizzled out little by little, and to make things even worse, time was running out. Every day of delay costs millions. Boeing had already poured over a billion dollars into the 747 program, and we all know that in every timeline, a billion dollars is a lot of money. Without working engines, the aircraft was grounded. Worse, no backup existed. The JT-9D was the only game in town. If it didn't work, neither did the 747. Boeing and Pratt and & Whitney went into overdrive. Engineers worked around the clock, redesigning components, reinforcing weak points, and pushing the engines to the edge. Each fix led to another failure, but progress was made inch by inch. Months turned into years. Patience turned into desperation. But with consistency came the miracle they've all been looking for. They cracked it. The JT-9D was cleared for flight. It was not perfect, but it was stable, just stable enough to get the 747 airborne. And with cheer in the hearts of even the cleaners, the program limped forward. It was bruised, but by all means, it was alive. But after every success came another Mount Everest to climb. Building the 747 wasn't just about designing a plane. It meant building an entire ecosystem to make that plane possible. 
Boeing had no factory large enough to assemble it, no tools big enough to handle it, no processes ready for something that massive. In Everett, Washington, Boeing began constructing what would become the largest building by volume on Earth, the 747 assembly plant. It had to be finished while the plane was still being designed. Engineers and construction crews worked side by side, dodging equipment, drawing blueprints on makeshift desks, sometimes in the cold and the rain because the roof wasn't finished yet. And even with the tight grip of tireless construction workers and engineers, costs exploded. The factory alone was a financial problem. It was like keeping a broke high-maintenance girl. Tooling, hiring, materials, and testing, it all bled money. By the time things were ramping up, Boeing had sunk over $2 billion into the 747 program. And if you tweak the numbers just to check how much that would be in today's world, that's more than $15 billion. And this was a bet the company situation. There was no safety net. The greatest gamble of all time. Matters got worse. 30th, 1960. The economy started to wobble. Fuel prices crept up. Interest rates rose. Boeing's cash reserves dried up. The company borrowed heavily, pushing its credit to the edge. Miss one milestone, an engine test, a flight, or a delivery, and everything could collapse. Internally, the pressure was crushing. Deadlines are sharper than a katana. Engineers worked seven-day weeks, sometimes sleeping under their desks. Managers held meetings at midnight. Mistakes weren't just setbacks. They were existential threats. Boeing had mortgaged its future on a plane that wasn't finished, using engines that barely worked in a building that was still under construction. The margin for error was absolutely zero. And after four years of gruesome labor on February 9, 1969, the prototype 747 was built and ready to take flight. It was massive, gleaming, and unlike anything the world had seen. It rolled out onto the runway at Payne Field. Years of pressure, setbacks, and sleepless nights came down to this moment. But here's what the public didn't know. Even Boeing's test pilots weren't sure it would survive the flight. The 747 was a radically new machine. It had a two-aisle interior, new hydraulic systems, new electrical layouts, unproven engines, unprecedented weight. Engineers had run the numbers, but paper calculations don't guarantee safe landings. The test crew, led by veteran pilot Jack Waddell, knew what they were up against. The flight plan was conservative, get it off the ground, make a basic circuit, and land. But even that was risky. Structural integrity, engine reliability, control surfaces, everything was still unproven at full scale. The plane was ready. The brakes were released. The throttles went up and the four JT-9D engines howled. It lifted off. Then, For two and a half heart-pounding hours, the giant plane flew. Flaps were tested, gear retracted, controls were checked, and miraculously, it worked. But hidden in the celebration was a serious problem, engine vibration. The JT-9Ds were still unstable at high thrust, Test flights in the coming weeks exposed more issues, engine stalls, overheating, unbalanced fuel flow. One flight nearly ended in disaster when a thrust reverser deployed midair. And there were other challenges. The plane's size created ground effect problems. It floated longer before touching down. Pilots had to retrain entirely how they landed. Even the steering on the ground required new procedures. Yet despite the technical chaos, Something extraordinary had happened. The impossible plane had flown. The 747 wasn't flawless, but it was real. And now, for the first time, the world has seen the future of flight actually take off. And finally, in January 1970, Pan Am Flight 1 took off from New York bound for London, marking the 747's first commercial flight. After years of doubt, cost overruns, technical near failures, and existential risk, the queen of the skies, was finally in service. It wasn't just a new plane. It was a revolution. The 747 could carry over 400 passengers, twice that of any other jet. Airlines could now sell cheaper tickets, opening long-distance air travel to the middle class. Tourism skyrocketed. 
entire economies were reshaped. Airports had to be redesigned just to accommodate the jet's size, new runways, gates, maintenance hangars. But the real triumph was that, in all its majesty, it outlasted the future everyone expected. Supersonic travel fizzled out like the gas in a carbonated drink. Concorde never became mainstream. Fuel prices, noise regulations, and maintenance costs made SSTs unviable for most airlines. The very threat that had once driven Boeing to hedge its design became irrelevant. The 747 ruled the skies. It carried presidents, pilgrims, and popes. It flew heads of state and humanitarian aid. It became a symbol of globalization. Over 1,500 units were built across multiple variants. It carried cargo, troops, space shuttle parts, even whole whales. For over 50 years, the 747 shaped the modern world. It wasn't the fastest. I dare say that it was the most efficient. And it was the one that showed up, decade after decade, flying farther, higher, heavier, and longer than anyone dared dream. And to think, it almost didn't happen. Today, as the last of the 747s are retired, its legacy is cemented. It wasn't just a plane, it was a gamble, a risk, a masterpiece born from uncertainty. The queen may be leaving the skies, but her shadow will always remain. 747 was too simple a name. Something like Velmera or Seraphinth would have played out wonderfully.